The man of steel has proven to be as vulnerable as the mere mortals who've looked up to him for more than half a century. Superman died Wednesday. There are few moments as memorable, iconic, or culturally significant as the closing pages of January 1993's Superman issue 75, where after a climactic battle against the hulking monster Doomsday, Superman, the most famous and beloved comic book character of all time, succumbs to his wounds and dies. In both the comic world and in the real world, a deafening silence fell. The whole planet collectively mourned the loss of its greatest hero. The Death of Superman story from DC Comics is one of the most instantly recognisable events in all of comic book history. I challenge you to find someone who hasn't at least heard of the time Superman was killed. This story was a tremendous success for DC, revitalising the company's sales at a time when Marvel was dominating the industry. But despite this, it could be said that in the long term, the Death of Superman story actually set the precedent for a form of storytelling that would negatively impact comics throughout the late 1990s and beyond. Either way, this story's legacy in itself is far-reaching and stands today as one of the most iconic moments in the history of modern fiction. So in this two-part video series, I want to analyse how such a story ever came to be explore the state of DC Comics in the early 1990s and try to find out just how things got to a situation where DC had to allow their greatest hero to die, just so the company could survive. Before we continue though, just a quick reminder to leave a like on this video if you enjoy it, and subscribe to Owen Likes Comics so you don't miss out on any future videos. Okay, so, in order to explain just how the death of Superman actually came into existence, I think we should first outline the state of both DC Comics and the comic book industry at the turn of the decade. The early 1990s was not a kind era for DC Comics, as the company found themselves lagging behind Marvel Comics in the sales, so much so that by 1991, DC's share of the market was only an estimated 20%. Now, this negative trend continued into the following year, as DC's slump saw the company also fall behind independent comic book company Malibu, marking the first time that a third party had outsold one of the two industry titans. As DC's former editor Dan Raspler explains, In the early 90s, Marvel consistently had the whole top 10. There was an inferiority complex that we all permanently had. Even Marvel's non-important titles would still be outselling important DC titles on a consistent basis. As you can imagine, DC were desperate to fight out of their slump and reclaim the top spots in the industry. And to do so, they figured they needed a story that would shake the comic book landscape to its very core. So, in late 1992, the company assembled a team of its most acclaimed and accredited writers to work together in creating a story so shocking that it wouldn't just boost their sales and win back comic book fans, but make headline news across mainstream media. Their plan? take the traditionally most popular and well-known character, Superman, whose sales were also stagnating in the years following John Byrne's departure from the series, and drastically change the character's status quo in the most unthinkable way possible. It was time for the Man of Steel to get married. While this may not sound as earth-shattering as what they ended up doing, the idea of finally having Clark Kent tie the knot with Lois Lane was quite noteworthy at the time, offering a resolve to their 50-year will-they-won't-they -they relationship, and taking cues from Marvel's success in marrying Peter and MJ in 1987's The Amazing Spider-Man Annual 21. Everything was in motion for this to work. Writers began ramping up the romantic tensions between Clark and Lois, with the planned culmination taking place in June of 1993's Adventures of Superman issue 500. But then came a problem. 
You see, the comic book writers weren't the only people seeking a big Superman story at the time, as the recently developed ABC sitcom show Lois and Clark The New Adventures of Superman was also planning on focusing on this same aspect of the pair's relationship, climaxing with an epic wedding at the show's finale. As a result, DC president Jeanette Kahn told the comic writers that their wedding would have to coincide with the TV shows, thereby forcing them to scrap their plans and go back to the drawing board. Now this, as you can imagine, was incredibly frustrating for the creative team at DC, who by this point felt overworked, exhausted, and bluntly out of ideas. And it was out of this frustration that longtime Superman writer Jerry Ordway said four fateful words that would go on to change the course of both the Man of Steel's life and the comic book industry as a whole. The famous last words uh, from Jerry Ordway were, let's just kill him, which Jerry said at every single meeting whenever somebody would get stuck. When we would sit there with blank chart to fill, he would say, let's just kill him. But in this moment, nobody laughed, but instead actually contemplated the idea. Louise Simonson, then writer of Superman the Man of Steel, recounted her experiences working on the X-Men series for Marvel, telling the group that Killing a major character shows just how much that character means to his friends, family, enemies, to the whole world. It was Mike Carlin, then group editor for all Superman titles, who gave the go-ahead for the death of Superman to be fully fleshed out. He recounts his reasoning behind this, stating that The world was taking Superman for granted, so we literally said, let's show what the world would be like without Superman. And with that, the decision was made. They would kill the Man of Steel in Superman issue 75 of January 1993, and then resurrect him later that year in Adventures of Superman 500. While this death was never meant to be permanent, the plan was for those five months to treat it as so, and DC would reap the rewards of a world in mourning of its most famous superhero. With the master plan now decided upon, the Superman writers had to devise a way for the last son of Krypton to actually die, and figure out who would be the one to end the hero's life. They ultimately decided that none of Superman's existing villains were believable enough to be the one to kill him, and so a new antagonist was required to do the job. The writers had to come up with Superman's doomsday, as Mike Carlin's infamous whiteboard described it, and they quite literally did just that. It was Dan Jurgens who would later write the climactic issue of the death of Superman's story, who would ultimately bring to life the Doomsday character we later became familiar with. Jurgens envisaged Superman's heroic sacrifice being a physical test like no other, and to achieve this, he needed to fight something more physically threatening than any of his existing rogues. And so, this genetically engineered Kryptonian deformity was born to achieve one simple task kill the Man of Tomorrow. With a premise decided and the plan set for both how Superman would die and who would be the one to kill him, DC began to put in motion their master plan. The first tease was released at the end of Superman the Man of Steel issue 17 from November 1992, where after the conclusion of the comic's actual story, the final page teased the debut of the mysterious hulking menace Doomsday with the subsequent issue formally introducing the new villain, breaking free from captivity and wrecking havoc across America, leading to a confrontation with the Justice League in JLA issue 69. Now, Doomsday single-handedly destroys the League and punches Booster Gold literally into space, where he's rescued by Superman. And when Superman asks who's attacked him, Booster simply replies, it's like Doomsday in here setting up for an epic showdown between the two in Superman issues 74 and 75, two issues which feature a gargantuan clash between the unstoppable force and a movable object. At the end of Superman issue 75 though, neither Superman or Doomsday are able to fully stop one another, and in a last ditch attempt to finally bring their foe down, they both swing for one final punch. Superman, with all of his tremendous might, loads his fist at the menacing creature with enough force to finally take it down. He succeeds, but with that, he too is mortally wounded. Superman falls into the arms of Lois Lane as the whole world watches on and succumbs to his wounds 
and quietly passes away. Superman was now dead. DC had gone all in on their last ditch attempt to revitalise their sales. The ace up their sleeve had been slid onto the table, but had it paid off? You only get one chance to tell a story like the death of Superman, but would people really believe and accept it? This was a make or break moment for the company. Thankfully, it worked. Superman issue 75 was released boldly declaring its intents on the cover. The infamous image of Superman's tattered cape wrapped around a pole, marking a makeshift grave for the now fallen hero. In terms of sales, Superman issue 75 was a monumental success, selling an estimated 4 million units and becoming both the best selling comic book of the year and also the highest selling Superman comic of all time. In one move, DC had also doubled their market share almost overnight, rising to a 31% share while Marvel found themselves plummeting down to around 17%. By sacrificing their greatest hero, DC Comics were once again on top of the world. But what would come next would ultimately leave the company and the comic book industry as a whole crashing back down to reality, as they now had to try and execute the second part of their plan and bring back Superman. The death of Superman, as seen in the climactic pages of Superman issue 75, was both a moment in time, one where the outside world stopped and acknowledged the loss of one of fiction's greatest heroes, and a monumental financial success for DC Comics. Mike Carlin, Dan Jurgens, Jerry Ordway, and the writers at DC had essentially, when backed into a corner, played the great ace up their sleeve, and it worked. Superman 75 became the highest selling comic book of the year and almost single-handedly doubled DC's entire share of the comic book market. To call it a success would be an understatement, but inherently it came with a lot of questions. Firstly, what happens now? How does DC carry on their multiple Superman comic books that were all among the best selling of the year? Could they really just cancel them all and let the Man of Steel rest in peace? The subsequent issues released after Superman 75, starting with Action Comics issue 685, began a story that was known as The Funeral for a Friend, a series of issues in which we see how Superman's death affects the existing Superman supporting cast and the wider DC universe. These issues truly aimed to touch on the heartstrings of its readership, and for the most part, they did just that. One of the more impactful moments in the whole issue comes in the form of the character Bibbo Babowski, a former down on their luck drunk turned bar owner who was a personal friend and admirer of Superman. For Bibbo, Superman was everything. He saved his life and gave him the confidence to become a better person. But in the morning, he sits in his empty bar in the dark and he pleads out into the unknown, asking, God, I gotta ask you, why? Why should Superman die and a washed up old roughneck like me goes on living? It ain't right, God. It just ain't right. This demonstrated the tremendous loss that the entire DC universe seemed to collectively feel. Superman was a hero to everyone. Every single person in the DC universe, respective of their different titles and series, seemed to have a story, a eulogy even, for the Man of Steel and these issues allowed for those stories to be told. However, arguably the most emotional moment of all came in The Man of Steel issues 20 and 21, when Lois Lane finally reaches out to Jonathan and Martha Kent, and the three break down and share their collective loss over the phone. John and Martha, watching the funeral processions from Smallville, were heartbroken as they bury their son's possessions in the backyard in the very crater where they discovered him all those years ago. This elderly couple represent the impact that Superman had on the everyman perfectly. He came into their life, literally fell out of the sky, and changed everything for them. He not only gave them a son, but a purpose. And that's when it happened. The strain of such a loss was too much to handle, and Jonathan 
suffers a heart attack, rushed into a nearby hospital, his heart flatlines, and with that, all of DC's Superman titles went on an official hiatus. You see, following the memorial issues, DC made the decision to cancel all of the four Superman comics for a three month period to allow audiences to truly grieve and also start to believe that Clark's death very well could be real. Weeks turned into months and no new issues of Superman, Action Comics and so on were released. Those who at first doubted the legitimacy of Superman's demise were slowly starting to think that this might be the real end for the last son of Krypton. While they kept a brave face to the outside world, DC Comics were frantically trying to come up with a way to bring Superman back, and do so in a way that felt tasteful and respectful, but also shared the epic stature of his death at the hands of Doomsday. As Dan Jurgens, one of the main Superman writers at the time, recalls it, When we got done telling the story, The Funeral for a Friend, we stopped publishing the Superman books for a while. At that point, we had yet not, or not yet decided how does Superman come back? How do we bring him back from the dead? And one of the things we realized by virtue of that is the entire world was watching. The company reassembled the same team of writers that had successfully killed him the year previous and instructed them to figure out how to carry on the story, even after the hero was no more. Ultimately, a number of different ideas were pitched. Roger Stern proposed an ancient alien-like Superman inspired by Marvel's Silver Surfer. Carl Kessel suggested a new take on the classic Superboy character described as an MTV Generation Superman. Dan Jurgens was vocal about wanting to reintroduce the character of Hank Henshaw, a Reed Richards-esque scientist turned villain that he'd created a few years prior, while Louise Simonson and John Bogdanov devised a new character altogether viewed as an African-American everyman, a blend of American folklore hero John Henry and Marvel's Iron Man. Unable to pick just one of these ideas, DC Editorial ultimately decided they have four Superman comics that they need to continue publishing and four different ideas for what to do next. So why not do all of them and dedicate each of the individual Superman titles to one of these new characters? And with that, the reign of the Superman began. Adventures of Superman issue 500 was always viewed as a milestone issue by DC Comics, and the writers always seemed to have a big plan in mind for this event. Originally, this was going to be the issue where Superman and Lois Lane got married, but those plans were scrapped, and the issue then became penciled in as the initial resurrection point for the Man of Steel. However, after the success of Superman 75 and the ensuing funeral for a friend issues, DC weren't quite ready to bring Superman back just yet, and instead they wanted to tell a story that would build and let readers fully anticipate the hero's return. So instead, Adventures 500 kicked off the event that would bridge the gap between death and resurrection. But first, the comic contained a heartfelt response to the previous cliffhanger, with Jonathan Kent seemingly finding himself in the afterlife, where he comes face to face with his son. Clark and John share a moment, with the father reminding his fallen son of his unwavering will to fight, and the pair leave heaven together. Jonathan then wakes up in his hospital room in Smallville, only to be found by his wife, Martha, besides him. He tells her that he not only saw but spoke to and was with Clark, setting the stage for Superman to eventually return, as the comic ends with Lois Lane visiting the tomb of the Man of Steel, and only to find his coffin empty. Following Adventures of Superman 500, these four new Supermen took centre stage in their respective titles. Stern's ancient alien-like Superman became the last son of Krypton and took action comics. Jurgens' reimagining of Hank Henshaw as a cybernetic Superman was showcased in the main Superman series. Carl Kessel's MTV-esque Superboy took adventures of Superman, while Simonson and Bogdanov's Steel aptly took the Man of Steel series. 
The reign of the Superman, named after Jerry Siegel and Joel Shuster's original 1933 short story, carried readers from June to October of 1993, as the four new Supermen attempted to carry on the legacy of the original hero. While Steel and Superboy were quickly outed as not being the real deal, questions still remained over both Cyborg Superman and the last son of Krypton, as both resembled the original hero and recalled many of the character's memories. However, it was ultimately revealed that not only were neither the authentic Superman, but that Cyborg Superman was in fact an existing Superman villain named Hank Henshaw, while the last son was outed as an ancient Kryptonian weapon known as the Eradicator, activated by the Fortress of Solitude and had stolen Superman's corpse and placed it in a regeneration matrix, using it as a source of his power and believing himself to be the real Superman. Eventually, the Eradicator's exposing of Superman's body to the Yellow Sun slowly repowered the fallen hero, with Superman breaking free of his captivity, donning a sleek black Kryptonian battle armour, and returned to confront his imposters. Superman ultimately teams up with both Steel and Superboy to fight Cyborg Superman and Mongol in the ruins of Coast City the former home of Hal Jordan, the Green Lantern, which had been previously decimated by the two villains. While Superboy stops a missile launched by Mongol from destroying Metropolis, Superman faces off against his cybernetic doppelganger, who attempts to kill his weakened foe using a lethal kryptonite gas, only to be stopped by none other than the Eradicator, sacrificing himself to save the real last son of Krypton, who swiftly defeats Henshaw and destroys his robotic body. Superman, once again alive and back in action, announces his return to a somewhat skeptical Lois Lane, who asks him what makes him any different from any of these imposter supermen, to which Clark simply responds, How about To Kill a Mockingbird? His favourite movie, and only a fact that few people, including Lois, actually knew. And with that reveal, Superman had been resurrected and returned to the pages of comic books for good. The death and return of Superman had been completed. The actual story of the death and return of Superman may have ended there, with the Superman status quo returning in Action Comics issue 692, but I think it's important to take a step back and look at the legacy that this story has, and evaluate how it impacted the comic book genre and industry with both its rise and eventual fall. It would be hard to argue that the death of Superman's story in itself was anything short of a tremendous success for DC, but the extent of its success set a dangerous precedent for the industry. As Reed Tucker notes, the success of the death of Superman may have surprised many within the industry, but it reinforced the idea that events equaled sales. DC's former editor Brian Augustin shares these sentiments, recalling an editorial meeting where he was told, We killed Superman and sold 4 million copies. Marvel is doing this or that and they're selling a million copies. We're not sure what it is, but these epic events are selling out and driving the market. In light of the death of Superman's success, Shaking up the status quo quickly became the status quo. Within a year of Superman being killed by Doomsday, DC decided to shake up Batman, introducing the villainous Bane in the infamous Nightfall story, breaking the hero's back, and replacing him with the much maligned John Paul Valley, aka Asriel. Likewise, the destruction of Coast City at the hands of the cyborg Superman led to a villainous turn for Hal Jordan, as his grief manifested in the form of Parallax. These epic changes weren't exclusive to DC either. In response, Marvel rolled out several game changes in the form of the Spider-Man Clone Saga and Heroes Reborn. And it was ultimately this flooding of the market with earth-shattering, status quo-altering stories, coupled with their overall reliance on variant covers, special editions, and collectibles, that caused the entire comic book market to crash in the late 1990s. Former DC writer Paul Kupperberg describes this best. He recalls how There was a ridiculous amount of money being made. 
a ridiculous amount of product being sold, but also ridiculous expectations during that time, I thought, holy god, we're heading for a fall. By the time that the reign of the Supermen was underway, comic book sales had began to drastically decline, with distributors stuck with mass quantity of Superman and other comics stuck on their shelves, when only the year prior, they couldn't sell them quick enough. This is put into perspective best by Brian Hibbs, a comic book retailer who told Reed Tucker that, I know a guy who made a throne out of unsold copies of Adventures of Superman number 500. A lot of people thought that it would sell as many copies as when he died. And of course, it didn't sell the tiniest, tiniest fraction of that. In the end, the death of Superman didn't actually kill the last son of Krypton. But instead, the series contributed to the sharp decline of the comic book boom period of the early 1990s. The comic's success represented the unprecedented heights that the industry experienced. But lightning rarely strikes twice, and in this instance, every act of diminishing returns only served to further damage the industry, leaving both Marvel and DC struggling, to this day, of regaining a fraction of the success they had in the days of the death of Superman. But with all of that said, I want to ask you one final question. What do you think the legacy of the death and return of Superman was? And how should we, as comic book fans, look back at this story and this moment? I think the death of Superman manages to represent both the highest and lowest points of the comic book industry. It's comics at their very best, and it's comics at their worst. While DC's attempts to capitalise on this iconic moment may have diminished the overall shine of the story as a whole, I find it fascinating to look back at how this entire scenario came to be. The collaboration of so many different writers and creative minds all pulling together to create one of the most groundbreaking and eye-catching stories at a time when DC Comics truly needed just that. Regardless of everything that came afterwards, you can't deny the sheer level of shock and awe that emerged when readers rushed to their local comic book store and gazed upon the climactic pages of Superman issue 75. If the intention of this entire story was, as the writers suggest, to remind the world of just how great Superman was, well, it's hard to argue they did anything less. In the end, the death of Superman was everything that it set out to be. A groundbreaking, monumental story that shook the DC Universe to its core, with an impact that can still be seen and felt throughout the comic book landscape today. And whether that's for better or for worse, is entirely up to you. Hey everyone, thank you so much for watching today's video, I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please make sure to leave a like on the video and leave a comment down below as well. Let me know your thoughts on everything we talked about in today's video, I can't wait to hear what you have to say as always. If you're new to Owen Likes Comics, please make sure to hit the subscribe button and the notify bell so you don't miss out on any future videos. And if you enjoyed this and you want some more, there should be some other videos on screen right now that you might also enjoy. If you want to help support the channel and help me make more videos, you can do so over at patreon.com slash owenlikescomics. Or if you just want some more of me, you can follow me on Twitter just at owenlikescomics. But that's all for this video. Again, thank you all so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it, and hopefully I will see you next time. But until then, take care and keep reading.